Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on digital technologies for energy management. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's webinar. You've joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You have the opportunity to submit your questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. And we will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end. I would now like to introduce Sabrina from the Carbon Trust. Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on digital technologies for energy management. Um, this webinar will be delivered by my colleagues Paul McKinney, David Posland and myself, um, Sabrina Kleisel from the Carbon Trust. We are also delighted to welcome Maria Rojas from the Climate Group to describe how this topic is core to their clients and members. Um, this is the second webinar um, from a project that the Carbon Trust have been carrying out on behalf of the Climate Works Foundation. Um, the study was designed to understand how digital technologies for energy management can support wider and more effective implementation of energy management and how the wider uptake of those technologies could be enabled. One of the key findings um, was the need for improved information for potential um, purchases of those technologies. And so a bias guide has been developed and launched um, by the Carbon Trust. In this webinar, we will talk um, you through the key aspects that buyers and users of digital technologies for energy management should be aware of. And hopefully you will then be able to refer to more detail in the guide. Um, before that, uh, I'm going to hand over to Maria from the Climate Group for an introduction um, um, uh, sorry, to, the, uh, to the activities and why it's important to them. Um, I want to spend um, a second introducing the organizations facilitating um, this webinar. So for those of you who do not know the Carbon Trust, we are a UK headquartered but increasingly global organization. We work with businesses, governments, and all sorts of organizations on various um, challenges in the transition to the sustainable to, to the sustainable low carbon economy. We provide advice to those organizations, ranging from big national and international policy questions right down to what lightning needs to be installed and specific applications. We design and manage programs ranging from some large ones like our 100 million pound offshore wind accelerator a joint R&D program through to low carbon city prog programs and energy efficiency technologies. We also certify and assure results on good environmental performance that includes certification and, and assurance around green bonds, but also around organizations and their performance on carbon, water and waste. Um, the Climate Works Foundation is the funder of this project and is, was established in 2008 um, it's a US-based philanthropic, um, and they collaborate with a wide range of funders, NGOs, um, and climate leaders um, from around the world to accelerate climate action. Don't want to spend too much on the climate group, as you're going to hear from them um, in a second. Um, but just quickly being introduced, the climate group um, brings together powerful networks of business and governments with the goal to shift global markets and policies towards the goal um, of reaching a world of no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. I'm handing over now to Maria. Um, Hello. Maria, Thank you, Sabrina. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you to the Carbon Trust. So my name is Maria Rojas and I am the manager for the EP100 campaign, um, the Climate Group's Global Energy Productivity Initiative. The initiative was launched in 2016 in partnership with the Alliance to Save Energy, which is our technical partner based out of DC. And the goal of the initiative is to bring together a group of growing um, energy smart companies committed to using energy more productively, lowering greenhouse gases, and accelerating a clean economy. So today I'm really going to talk about, um, introduce the campaign, and talk a little bit about how our members are using digital technologies to improve their energy productivity. 
So I will start by first telling you what energy productivity is. Um, energy productivity is technically defined as the ratio of economic output to energy consumption. So it is looking to decouple economic growth from energy use. Um, as a concept, it's a powerful tool for companies to understand their energy use through a financial lens. Um, it allows a company to have a specific metric and by choosing this metric um, and using technologies to track energy use, they can see improvement over time. Um, it's also a concept that helps elevate the use of smarter use of energy from boiler room to the boardroom. So for a lot of our members, this helps uh, for energy managers to make the case for different investments um, and get buy-in from the board and the executive team. Um, it also brings wider economic benefits um, in addition to energy efficiency benefits such as saving energy and saving um, money companies are also seeing co-benefits from energy productivity so they're doing more with less um, and really being able to build the business case for for energy productivity so we see this reflected in our membership um, our members their key drivers are financial savings, greenhouse gas reductions, and reputational benefits. Um, and the, camp, the initiative is a global initiative, um, and companies are making a voluntary commitment to energy productivity. They are we're working in partnership um, with the Alliance to Save Energy, as we mentioned, as well as well as the World Wind Building Council. And we're also part of the Women Business Coalition, which is um, a coalition of partners like WWF, CEP. And as part of that coalition, we are also working to influence policy, building an ambition loop where efforts across sectors reinforce each other. So to give you a snapshot of our membership, we have 40 companies with headquarters in 14 countries and operations um, in a lot more countries than that globally. They're in nine different sectors and they represent um, 345 billion in combined revenue. These companies um, are really spread across um, different sectors. And the idea is that companies, regardless of whether you're in heavy manufacturing um, or if you are in real estate, you can commit to using energy more productively um, and monitoring your, your energy use. So actually, I'll go back to this, um, just to mention that as part of the initiative, um, we provide a platform for companies to share and showcase that their leadership and progress. Um, so we have a peer learning program. Um, we have speaking opportunities for our members. Um, we participate in investor roundtables and um, hold member meetings, as well as expert led webinars. So to join the EP100 initiative, uh, we have three pathways. And across these pathways, uh, mon monitoring energy use is, of course, key to all of them. So um, the first one, cutting out energy waste, a company would commit to implementing an energy management system um, coupled with a DTM um, within 10 years. And then they would also be committing to an energy productivity target to help continuous improvement. Um, in the doubling energy productivity pathway, they're choosing an um, energy productivity metric and then can track progress from a baseline as early as 2005, but are committing to doubling energy productivity within 25 years. And this, when we first launched the campaign, was really seen as a very difficult goal for, for a lot of companies to reach. But um, as the campaign has grown and we've been able to demonstrate the, what, the, what members can really do, we're seeing uh, members that are passing this goal. We just last, um, yesterday, we had a company join uh, Rome International Airport, and they've actually committed to 150% improvement. So ambition is growing um, and companies are really showing that this is something that can be done with some amazing stories of 
increasing um, energy productivity by 40% in just one year. And um, not just going for low hanging fruit, which of course is a first step for a lot of these companies, but really showing sub changes across the board. Um, and it really starts with monitoring energy use, of course. And the last pathway is net zero convert buildings. We're working with World Green Building Council on this. Um, and companies are committing to only owning, managing, occupying um, buildings across their entire portfolio that are net zero carbon in operation. Um, and of course, that's incorporating energy efficiency targets, um, as well as only sourcing renewable energy. All of our companies are reporting progress annually, and actually our report will be out in July. Um, to help increase transparency and, of course, share some of these amazing findings. So uh, before I, I sign off, I just wanted to share a little bit about the different metrics a company can choose to show that it's, um, again, it's something that can be an effective tool for, for companies across different sectors. Um, so a company is choosing a metric that best, fit, best fits their vision for success, such as units produced to energy consumed or revenue per energy consumed. Um, again, showing flexibility and allowing each company to understand and adapt the efficient technologies, operational practices, and employee behavior that are most appropriate to its industry. Um, we have companies from heavy manufacturing, um, cement industry, um, chemicals to, again, real estate companies, uh, companies with a lot of retail, and they're all finding that managing energy efficiently is becoming easier thanks to these technologies. Um, and again, they're, they're also not just saving energy, but they're increasing the services provided by each unit of energy. So just to close, in the wake of the 2018 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, um, the IPCC report, the need for the private sector to drive energy productivity improvement is urgent. Um, and as EP100 members have demonstrated, the opportunities around increasing energy productivity far outweigh the barriers. Um, and I'm sure you'll learn a lot more about the technologies that are helping make that possible um, and bolstering a company's bottom line, driving innovation, and of course, driving competitiveness as well. So um, I know that there'll be time for questions at the end, but for now, I just wanted to close with my email um, if anybody has any follow-up after this. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, thank you for this interesting overview about the EP100 initiative, and thank you for hosting today's webinar, or co-hosting today's webinar. Um, so now on to the introduction. Um, Maria's made this point before, but I think it it's worth stressing it. Um, energy efficiency is obviously critical to any efforts in limiting um, climate change. And as you can see in the chart, um, energy efficiency is perhaps the largest area, or like provides perhaps the largest area for improvement in emissions over the coming decades. Um, and I would like to note in the IEA report where this chart um, has been taken, from they have highlighted in particular energy management as a key area um, to identify those measures. Um, and also interestingly, energy management itself um, is leading to or it can lead to very unique opportunities um, for saving um, energy that otherwise would not be identified and are specific to ongoing good management on energy. Um, so now um, focusing more on the digital technologies for energy management. So first of all, it's probably worth us talking about what we actually mean um, when we talk about digital technologies for energy management or DTEM um, as an acronym and how they can transform the way we measure, monitor and ultimately um, save energy. So um, what we are talking about here are tools um, that gather energy and operational data from meters um, and sensors. Um, these tools usually use software to report, analyze, and then act on that data. 
And we're talking here um, both about um, the software and the physical infrastructure. Um, savings from identifying physical upgrades and from new control or behavioral changes. And these are really the key underpinning um, tools um, for an effective energy management system or strategy. Um, it is key to know that um, here as well, um, that these tools themselves are not a strategy um, on their own, um, but they provide the input um, to a strategy and um, to an energy management system. And while the strategy needs to include aspects also of communication within the organization um, about target setting and mobilizing various um, human and other resources um, of an organization in order to realize the best outcomes um, from energy management. For this study, we have adopted five categories of digital technologies for energy management, um, and those apply differently um, to different kinds of buildings um, or industries. The starting point um, is around energy metering, monitoring, and targeting, um, often something that is um, that lays the, the base, is the basis for an energy management strategy. Um, and this probably requires um, not much further explanation, um, but it's a key part of understanding um, the starting point, um, what your energy consumption actually is. Building automation systems in the building context, um, additionally, um, automated control um, over what's happening, particularly within systems like ventilation, air conditioning, lighting, for example. Um, fault detection and diagnostic systems provide um, real-time reaction to issues that are coming up in buildings or in an industrial process. And to be able to either automatically correct um, those faults or suggest um, how to deal and how to amend um, further faults. Um, automated system optimization provides um, and dynamic optimization, particular in buildings, and automatic optimized process control helps to ensure the best operating conditions in a manufacturing setting. So these categories are mostly helpful for laying out a range of features that may be out there um, for DTEM, but we don't want to get too hung up on those definitions um, as there might be some products which fall into uh, multiple um, of those categories. Or, um, but I hope at least it gives um, a sense of what we try um, to look at um, as part of this study. So our goal um, was to explore what is needed, what could lead to higher uptake um, of DTEMs and ultimately um, lead to higher amounts of energy saved. That was really the key question um, for us. And in particular, we had a hypothesis around the role of improved information sources, particularly web-based or in some other sort of digital information source. Um, and to uncover some of the unknowns um, in the study, we did a high level um, policy review in um, seven countries. You can see them listed on the right hand side. So we um, looked at South Africa, China, Germany, the US, Brazil, India, and Mexico. And we have followed um, that up with 301 quantitative surveys in three focus countries, um, especially South Africa, China, and Germany, um, which gives us a geographic spread and also different types of um, composition and size of economies. Um, we followed that quantitative research up with 28 interviews in the same focus countries. So some high level key findings um, that I want to introduce you to um, that emerged from the quantitative research together with the interviews. Um, they focus on really three kinds of stakeholders. So first of all, concerning the existing users and potential buyers um, of such tools. And we see that better information would really help convert those potential users to users. Um, secondly, um, the suppliers of such technologies, um, they play a key role for customers in trying to figure out what they need to implement and how they can best use it. And they have a key role when it comes to 
demystifying um, those technologies. And then finally, on the policymaker side, it's very clear that information is not going to be enough to encourage um, the level of uptake that we want to see. Um, there are some policy interventions um, which can be complementary um, to this and facilitate um, the uptake. Um, so, as we have mentioned before, we have seen information is key to the uptake um, of digital technologies for energy management. So, to support this further, um, we have created a bias guide, um, which you can find following the link um, on the bottom of this page. And my colleagues, Paul and Dave, are going to um, talk about it um, even more in a minute. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, at the moment, we can see that there are many examples um, of TTEMs being installed, but they do not always achieve um, the benefits that people would expect or would hope for. So that's why um, the before mentioned BIOS guide um, will also include a section for users and how they can make the most of their um, DTEM. An important finding from our research and experience um, of carrying out energy audits within organizations internationally um, over many years is that those systems are rarely used to their maximum effect. And we have here listed some examples of um, why that might be the case. So very popular one is the fit and forget. So sophisticated energy monitoring and building automation systems can be installed and left collecting data that are rarely used or control set up um, that are not monitored or optimized um, as working patterns of buildings um, or the use of buildings seem to change. Facilities management. So the DTEM control may be given to teams that are responsible for the comfort and energy purchasing, but they might not necessarily take energy consumption into consideration. Staff move on. So we frequently find that a committed member of staff has, has ownership um, for the energy management strategy and the tools, but then once they move on to another role or company, the ownership and engagement um, can be lost. Controls are overridden, so it's very common for building control systems to be overridden to provide for a temporary need um, or to overcome a fault and then never be returned to optimized automated operation. Poor system communication, so um, where different components of DTEM systems have been installed over time, particularly from different suppliers. It's common to find problems um, with getting these systems to reliably talk to each other if you want. This can reduce the accuracy of data and control and increase the risk of systems being overridden. So, to kind of counter um, those kinds of issues, we have created a web-based bias slash user guide, um, which hopefully will help you overcome those um, information barriers. Um, the bias guide includes um, a few key chapters about what are the terms, what are the key char characteristics, what are the benefits. So we're talking about energy benefits, financial, but also um, non-financial benefits. Um, how can we or how can DTEM support, how can we support you in building um, a robust business case? Um, we're going to look into what kinds of questions you might want to ask the suppliers before purchasing um, such a tool. What needs to be or like how can DTEM best be incorporated in an organization's energy strategy? And then as mentioned before, one chapter about um, a user guide. So we hope you find this um, very interesting and will help you um, with your purchase or your um, with, sorry for purchasing um, a DTEM or if you already have one how to um, overcome certain barriers. I'm now handing over to my colleague Paul to um, give you further insights to this interesting topic. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Um, I'm Paul McKinney. I'm a senior manager here within the Carbon Trust programs and innovations team. Uh, I've worked on providing advice through programs to SMEs and larger companies um, for over 25 years. And 
throughout that time, I think the importance of measuring energy use and optimizing building controls has always been important. But now there's definitely lots more cheaper, more effective, more sophisticated solutions available to help you do this. Um, in some ways, the sheer amount of choice of product and system and supplier is sort of part of the problem to the uptake of D10. And uh, users in the survey that we did told us that they're confused about what they should purchase and where to find it. Uh, so hopefully this talk and uh, the uh, buyers and users guide we've created will help uh, with, with that, with overcoming some of those difficulties. I'm going to start at the beginning um, with why consider di digital technologies uh, for energy management in the first place. Uh, and you might just be thinking your energy costs are high, so why not go out and buy some energy management software, for example. But the most effective approach is always um, to, to think about reducing energy use as part of a, an overall energy management strategy. Uh, and this will help ensure that, that any um, energy management tools that you purchase are appropriate to your needs. Um, and that you can also integrate them in with other energy saving activities. It's much more likely to be effective and the benefits are much more likely to endure in the longer term and overcome some of the, the issues that Sabrina was talking about. Um, there's lots of advice available from the Carbon Trust and elsewhere on how to develop an energy strategy. Um, the main components just listed here um, um, and, and expanded on in, in our bias guide are um, some of the key aspects are that, first of all, in just ensuring that there's someone responsible for implementing that strategy. So that um, usually an energy manager, but it doesn't have to be a full-time person, that could be a part-time role, but they've got a specific responsibility for, for delivering that energy strategy. But they also need to have the senior management backing um, and the, the, the culture of the organisation has to be supportive uh, to make that effective. Um, uh, there are a number of aspects of energy management that can be done with, with very little cost, uh, but some energy projects, including investment in digital technologies, uh, will require a budget. So it's quite a good practice to have a ring fence budget for energy saving type projects. Maybe there'll be specific and different return on investment criteria. Um, and obviously it's important to, to when you think about energy saving technologies, to think about whole life costing. So. Maybe, things, maybe efficient equipment might cost a little bit more to start with, but over the course of its lifetime will save money. Automatic monitoring and targeting uh, is often the first step towards installing digital technologies and um, that you might take. Uh, and amongst other things, it can, can help you by helping you understand your energy use uh, and where it might be being wasted that can then help justify further investment in more sophisticated uh, digital technologies, so in sophisticated controls, et cetera. Once you've um, uh, adopted uh, an energy strategy and appointed the key personnel, um, you, you're then in a much more, uh, much stronger position to make best use of, of any uh, digital technologies for energy management that then get installed. The, the advantage of D10 within the context of an energy strategy is that all of, all of the components reinforce each other. So your energy strategy should help, should enable you to successfully manage energy processes throughout your organisation. The, the D10, um, as you install it, will help identify the best energy saving projects. It can also help identify how successful those projects have been and how much they've saved, which reinforces the benefits of the energy management program. Um, and it may be that, as I said earlier, that some of those projects are to implement further digital technologies like advanced building controls and fault detection software. Um, and then the data from the, the DTM systems will also feed directly back into the energy strategy itself and inform what the key priorities are um, uh, and of course, ultimately, all of this will lead to a more efficient use of energy, um, which should reduce cost and potentially improve your reputation as a supplier or service provider. So getting a bit more specific, what can digital technologies for energy management offer you? 
Well, firstly, they can allow you to monitor your energy consumption almost by definition um, and should help you detect avoidable energy waste. They can help notify unexpected energy use. So often uh, energy use might be predictable and consistent and being monitored in that way. But as soon as something goes wrong or there's some change to production or um, just something unusual happens, then it's much quicker to um, identify and flag up a, an issue uh, when, when things have changed. And the, the uh, technologies themselves may have alarms that, that draw attention to things going wrong. This can then allow quick and effective remedial action. Um, so many times uh, we found that fitting monitoring equipment has highlighted problems that people, operators and facilities managers didn't know didn't know that were happening. So if maybe energy use using equipment running at night when there was no one there. As well as uh, monitoring, digital technologies can be used to provide control. They can give real-time adjustment of controls, um, although obviously you do have to be careful about um, who you give the control to and how much control you give, because it can be just as easy to turn the temperatures up with a, um, um, control systems as to turn them permanently down. One of the beauties of digital technologies is that they can help quantify the resulting savings of energy saving projects that you implement, um, including um, installing the, uh, the DTEM itself in the first place. Um, as well as alarms for specific problems, DTEM can also be used to identify trends to study for further areas of potential improvement. So they, they often would identify some very short-term savings which can help pay for themselves and then identify longer-term improvement potential. And if you are running as part of your wider energy management strategy, staff awareness activities, then the digital technologies can help provide useful data to both illustrate the potential for more savings and also to collect the impact of any measures undertaken, maybe by staff have suggested, where staff have suggested them. By improving control of energy use, uh, it can also be more possible to be more accurate when setting energy budgets within a company, so the overall financial control can be better. And finally on this list is the ability to undertake meaningful benchmarking. So this might be a process, uh, uh, might be just for one process, For um, it might look at benchmarks from one day to another or across multiple buildings within a company or measuring your consumption against published benchmarks of other types of companies. So all of these potential uses and benefits should be considered when you're um, building that business case uh, to either purchase or upgrade uh, digital technologies for energy management. And um, just remember, it's not just as simple as, um, well, I'm going to put in some software and it's going to make savings of 10% and, and cost me this much. It's a sort of wider, uh, a wider set of benefits. So now we'll move on to how you select the right type of um, energy management technologies. I'm going to come on to some of the features to look for, but first, firstly, just to highlight for those that are new to the area, we've included in, in our bias guide a, a very simple selection tool, which just takes you through some of the key questions and makes suggestions for a uh, sort of high level suggestion really for the type of system that you might want to consider or what aspects might be beneficial to upgrade. Um, so yeah, some of the some of the aspects of that, uh, the types of questions are shown on here, um, which is a step-by-step -step tool uh, that's accessible through the through the website. Um, one thing to remember is that selecting the optimum uh, digital technologies for your particular requirement will influence the cost of the system and the effectiveness. And and over specifying what you need is, is sort of just as ineffective as under specifying. Uh, you might be adding functionality that's that's got extra costs with no a particular extra benefit. Um, so it's useful to think about what types of requirements are going to be worthwhile for your site. Um, so in this next section, I'm just going to talk through some of the 
features to look out for in some of the different types of systems. Um, depending on your utility meter type and contract and energy, you may be able to obtain energy consumption data from your supplier. Um, and that there may be some analysis that you can do on software tools provided by them. Uh, but obviously that's only site level data and, and what's available and when can be limited. Um, so most automatic monitoring and targeting systems, um, which is the first type we're going to look at, will incorporate some sub-metering and allow you to identify usage of individual pieces of equipment. Uh, so that might include sub-metering of boilers or lighting or um, heating, ventilation and air conditioning equipment maybe across individual floors within a building. In industry, that might include sub-metering industrial hot water and steam boilers, um, compressed air systems, uh, industrial chillers, um, or sort of by process, or it could be individual process lines. And um, digital technologies, and AMT systems specifically, also enable building uh, monitoring and control across multiple sites, um, potentially controlled from a single uh, web-based access point. Um, all the systems are likely to include a level of logging and analysis and some form of dashboard output. Um, but you may also want to look for the ability to be able to tailor the reports, uh, maybe for different types of users. Uh, some systems will let you actually set targets for uh, particular levels of energy consumption in different areas for a day, maybe with alarms to, to, to um, go off when there's unusual energy use or energy use above target. They could be, and they could be alarms on the screen of the system or they could, be, could send emails or texts automatically. Um, it's also very helpful to be able to export the results from AM&T systems uh, to do more in-depth analysis. When it comes to building energy management systems, so these are um, actually uh, controlling some of the systems as well as just monitoring the energy use. Um, typically, they will include an AM and T function within them alongside the real time uh, monitoring and control of the building services plan. They should allow for different modes of operation, to, um, which can account for seasonal variations uh, adapting to different levels of occupancy. Um, often they'll monitor environmental conditions, so uh, maybe, usually the temperatures, but also potentially air flows or carbon dioxide levels, for example, um, both ex internally and temperatures externally as well. And then they'll use all that data to optimise the efficiency of the building. They'll often also measure and use wider parameters, so valve positions and flow rates and, and other control functions to help control the system. And the um, the more advanced systems will control, allow you, will measure and control more different items and so potentially giving greater flexibility, but also um, the more control, the more different inputs there are, there's obviously higher risks of um, things uh, being unintended consequences if, if it's not configured well in the first place or if sensors fail and provide faulty information. So it's important not to over-specify, as I said earlier, but to think about what's most appropriate for you. Uh, typical features in uh, building energy management systems include real-time monitoring, uh, setting environmental set points, uh, and, and data logging. Um, they can also trigger alarms to highlight unexpected areas of energy use or maybe faulty equipment. Um, some systems will include planned and preventative maintenance scheduling uh, built in, so uh, based on the Readings coming back from the equipment, they'll tell you um, maybe when uh, filters might need checking because uh, air flows are slowing down, for example. Um, companies operating across multiple sites might find a benefit in selecting a, a single system that can operate across all of their sites to allow, enable sort of central control. Uh, moving on to industrial uh, um, DTEM type systems. Uh, SCADA is probably the most commonly used uh, um, control system, process control sy type systems uh, in industry, um, which use networked data communications and usually graphical user interfaces. 
um, giving you a high level of supervisory management and control of processes. Uh, it don't, doesn't tend to be specific to controlling energy, so it's more about controlling the overall process, um, but often they uh, can be uh, um, commissioned to uh, or configured uh, to minimise energy use and, and monitor energy use. Uh, sometimes the data itself will need to be exported into other AM and T type packages for, um, for more sophisticated analysis than can be done within the, the system itself. Typical features within SCADA systems include customizable dashboards, graphical interfaces, real-time um, uh, monitoring of devices and, and set points. Um, and they will often also include exceptional fault alarms uh, and planned and preventative maintenance scheduling. So when choosing to install uh, energy management digital technologies. It's important to, to um, select the most appropriate technology, as I've said, only the features you need. Um, but you, you will definitely need to ensure that uh, systems you put in are scalable, um, so that if your needs change in future that you can potentially expand them, and you should be looking for uh, maintenance agreements to ensure a sort of long-term um, maintenance and uh, long-term reliability. Um, our experience is that retrofitting a, a new building energy management system is, is within an existing building, maybe, maybe there's already one that's uh, become becoming obsolete, is, is generally quite difficult and really suited better to when you a new build situation or when you're doing a deep refurbishment. Um, otherwise, it probably uh, safe is trying to upgrade what you already have and, and maybe put modern add-ons to a system that's already in place. Um, and um, the, if you do upgrades, that can significantly enhance the system impact on energy efficiency um, by giving users sort of better in interaction and accessibility. AM and T is, is easier to retrofit a brand new system, sort of regardless of what you have there already. Uh, modern systems are cloud-based and wireless, and so you can um, connect up to existing sensors or put in new sensors. Um, and overlay a, a new AMT system more easily. Of course, one of the difficulties is finding a supplier to uh, to who do you go to to install your um, new detail system or even to select it. And there's a, certainly a wide range of equipment suppliers around. And um, we found in our survey uh, that we did that there was so 45 different suppliers mentioned, most of them only mentioned a few times, so it's a very um, um, broad set of uh, companies uh, available to talk to. We're not able to endorse particular suppliers, um, but we'll have some questions, the types of things to ask them um, in our, in our uh, buyer's guide. And we certainly encourage you to make sure you talk to several different suppliers. Um, trade shows can be a good place to be able to talk to several all at the same time. Uh, to make sure that you uh, get a good understanding of what they can do for you. One of the things we looked at into uh, in our uh, study was the scope for um, potentially creating a comparison website between different types of um, DTEM tools. Um, we, um, please, there's a number of challenges to that, uh, make, making sure that sort of um, ratings are subject um, uh, have some sort of objectivity to them um, and assessing things like data security for different companies and different needs is quite difficult uh, but we were pleased to find that there are some companies at least on the energy management software side that do provide uh, comparison sites um, so they potentially a good place to start if you're looking at um, new to look for providers of um, um, certainly the sort of initial energy management software and monitoring and targeting software. Um, one of the key findings is that uh, I suppose users, potential purchasers of, of DTEM aren't really sure what to ask uh, the suppliers. So um, we'd advise you to, well, certainly familiarise yourself with the, the information and the features, the potential features available through the buyer's guide. 
Um, and then we've also got lists of questions um, that you can ask suppliers and also um, recommend you talk to reference sites. And we've got some lists of questions that you can talk to the um, referee sites about. <coughs> in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of talking to <coughs> potential suppliers, um, some of the key questions are, are listed are here. Um, so for features kind of standard, whether, particularly things about whether you can do things like tailoring reports and adding extra metering without too much extra cost. Um, and then obviously you want long-term support <coughs> from the companies. Um, my final section is about uh, uh, building the, the business case for um, um, these new systems. Um, once you've identified the system suppliers, um, obviously you need to then get approval to <coughs> um, purchase and implement. And certainly our experience is that um, just identifying the system and the cost of it and the potential savings is only half the battle. Um, being able to make a good case for management to, um, to purchase the system is, is essential. And uh, we'd, we'd, we'd recommend you looking at our um, guide on making a business case for a carbon reduction project and this sort of shows you all the other potential benefits beyond the energy savings uh, that um, you need to, you could consider in terms of building that case um, and it also talks um, this guy talks quite a bit about um, how to put together a, a strong business case um, for for energy well for any energy saving type investment making sure that the um, what you're presenting is tailored to the decision makers presented in a way they can understand um, and um, making sure you understand their motivations and try and get some advance sort of sponsorship in advance so uh, uh, obviously if you um, do go away and have a look at uh, the guide afterwards for the final section I'm now going to hand over to uh, Dave my colleague Dave Pazan who's going to talk through some of the um, issues that people have with uh, once in, um, DTEM systems have been installed and how to potentially overcome some of those issues. Okay, thank you Paul. Um, so my name is David Powsland. I've been working in the field of energy management and energy projects for the past 10 years. Um, in particular, I have a background in the application and utilisation of AMT systems for energy management. Um, so the user guide section of DTM, um, as you'll see, it focuses around the common issues in implementing and operating digital tools such as AMT, BEMS and SCADA as, as Paul has introduced. But also as part of the user guide, it does introduce um, management reporting, how to implement management reporting off the back of your digital tools. And further into the user guide, you'll see links through to our monitoring and targeting guidance as well. Um, so just on to the next slide. So ju just to summarise, um, in terms of the user guide, I'm going to talk through some of the aspects around common issues with using digital tools. And um, there's a lot more detail actually in the guide itself. Um, but I think first of all it's important to try and categorise what type of problems you will have with digital tools. So firstly the technology itself, implementing that technology and the commissioning. So commissioning is an extremely important aspect if you're putting in digital tools for energy management. So an example is with AM T systems when you're putting in new submetering systems um, into switchboards and having a, a meter connected to current transformers, a very common issue is having the current tra transformers the wrong way around and having incorrect data. And um, it really comes down to having appropriately skilled um, engineers putting in your system for you for that. When it comes to maybe more of the smart control systems such as BEMS and SCADA, co the commissioning stage is extremely important in having all of your set points correct for what your building or process needs. So that may be what your temperature dead band control set points are um, and process control set points in order to, to get what you need for an efficient process. So that's sort of the, the initial technology aspects. 
Um, secondly, and, and kind of reflecting on what um, Paul and Sabrina were saying earlier, um, one of the major issues is around operational ownership of that digital tool. So having an individual or a team within the organization who has the appropriate skills to use the digital tool. So um, I guess with SCADA systems for sort of process, for processes and industry, you're very likely to have an engineer who's uh, well equipped to use that process tool, to use your SCADA. But in particular, when you consider AM&T systems or building energy management systems, often you may have one or two individuals or, or maybe no individuals who are specialists in that. Um, I think it's important that you do identify someone and give some responsibility for owning and running um, the m and system or BEM system within a building to make sure that there's ongoing use of that system and make sure they're empowered as well. So they're empowered that if they see something wrong in the data or they identify an opportunity for energy saving, they're empowered to go and talk to senior management to try and make that change. Um, and there's a few of the examples in here. So personnel changes, obviously a barrier to that. Um, and uh, yeah, lack of ownership and clear responsibilities is highlighted on the, on the slide as well. Following on from that, the third element is ongoing maintenance of your digital tools. Um, so off the back of the ownership challenge, there should be an ongoing um, program of maintenance or ongoing responsibilities for maintenance as well so if we see that um, there's issues in the data or there's communication issues to your BMS or SCADA who has the responsibility to explore that and bring in contractors or bring in the on-site engineer to action a change so um, common issues may be calibration of meters so steam meters for instance may be recalibrating quite often uh, failure of pulse meters may be an issue. Um, and also, I guess, over the longer term, just making sure that the system is up to date and that your software is upgradable. So there may be times when you need to have a, a software upgrade to make sure that um, the system is, is safeguarded for the future. Um, so please, for more information, just go and have a look at the, the section on user guide in DTM and have a flick through of the uh, management reporting and the monitoring targeting guide as well for, for more information. So next slide. Okay, yeah, so this this is an additional slide, I wouldn't expect this one, but yeah, as I was saying earlier, meters being bypassed for a and gaps in the data and incorrect calibration, time clocks and seasonal commissioning on BEMS can be a challenge and faulty sensors and Overriding of systems by operators can be a challenge on the SCADA as well. Okay, so once again, there's the link there, www.carbontrust.com forward slash DTM, if you'd like to have a look through the pages. Okay, so that's the end of the webinar. Do we have any questions? So, um, yes, if anyone would like to um, type in questions into the <clears throat> into the uh, box on the right on the right hand side of the screen, um, there is a there is a question that's asking about data granularity that I'm going to pass back to you, Dave. So it's to do with what level of data granularity is typical or recommended, I think. Um, obviously, um, half hourly data um, is common for energy, sort of general energy management. But I think um, if you're looking at particular equipment, then you um, can be looking at modern equipment. Modern uh, monitoring software can, can look at much uh, sort of faster, uh, granu a lower, higher granularity. So, have you got, is there anything you can add? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess we're talking in terms of, of AM and T, then half hourly is the most common uh, granularity of data you will have. But um, 
uh, certain clients or previous clients of mine would have selected for further granularity so getting it down to 15 minutes or 10 minutes or less um, but you need to consider the type of site and communication challenges around that as well um, but when it comes to more of the, of the BMS and the SCADA uh, type systems you may want further granularity and and the ability to look at almost live data to see what's what's going on as well um, but it may be that those systems don't store a history of data you may be able to look back over a week or two weeks but it may be of down to one second granularity for instance so you can see exactly what's going on okay. does anyone have any other um, questions we'll, we'll wait for a, a couple of minutes to see if any further questions come in Okay, well, um, thank you everyone to uh, attending. Um, after the uh, webinar, we will send you round soon a copy of the uh, presentation um, and a link to the um, user guide, advice guide on the website. Um, and if you do have any sort of questions that you think of afterwards, um, then do come back to us uh, on that on that email address, and we'd be happy to have a sort of um, separate chat with you. Um, if there's anything we can help with. Thank you very much.